an entire world is ready for you to start your career teaching the path to wellness. Mastering the science of mindfulness and the art of coaching. To help clients achieve mental, emotional, and physical betterment of life. Through movement, nutrition, recovery, and regeneration. Because impacting one person impacts a family. Impacting a family impacts a community. And impacting a community impacts the world. Become an NASM Certified Wellness Coach. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's edition of the Master Instructor Roundtable. I'm Marty Miller, Regional Master Instructor, with my fellow Regional Master Instructor, Miss Wendy Batts. Wendy, how's everything going today? It's going well. How are you? Good. I'm ex looking forward to today's topic. I know this is something that we got a lot of emails about. And in the 17 plus years we've been teaching for NASM, in 20 plus years we've been working with this model, this topic always comes up. It does. And it is a very common compensation right. and another w reason that we wanted to do this. So again, thank you for the emails that are coming in with, you know, questions of, of you know, what you need and, and areas that you need help in. So we do really appreciate the feedback that we're getting from you guys. And we have seen common commonalities, if you will, with the emails of, can you go over the knees moving in? Um, we see it a lot in the assessment process. So first of all, good for you for doing the assessment, because as Marty and I say, if you're not assessing, you're guessing. And um, because the knees moving inward is a commonly or a common compensation, um, I think today's webinar hopefully will be helpful for many. And I'm looking forward to covering the content. Yes, indeed. So <laughs> I, I, yes, indeed. I know we will cover it in great detail. I'm confident. I am too. So let's talk about what we're going to talk about, which is basically the compensations of the knees moving inward. Now, oftentimes we will hear people ask, well, how come you guys talk about the knees moving inward more than you talk about the knees moving outward? And the easiest answer that I have for this is twofold, which I guess isn't quite so easy, is it's not as common. Is it does it happen? Absolutely. Every quote body is different. So you can't just assume that the knees are going to move inward or there's no there's not going to be a compensation. So if the knees do legitimately move outward, then what we strongly suggest is then move into the single leg squat assessment to see if you notice any changes, because oftentimes if the feet are straight and the knees move outward, then when you put them on a single leg and take that, you know, the the um, you're shortening the uh kind of distance, I guess, and you're working on your balance, you're going to notice it's oftentimes the knees move inward. And then you would use the single leg assessment over the double leg. And so, you know, or if people are like, well, I noticed that the feet were turned out and the knees were going out. Well, remember, we're looking for the track or the tracking of the knees staying in line with the second and third toe. So if the feet are going out, they're still tracking with the second, and third toe then I don't know if I necessarily would put the knees moving outward. I would actually put that the feet were turning outward and the knees tracked. So just something to think about, but we're going to cover that. that. Guy, though, Wendy, I am the knee goes out. So if we ever need a case study down the line on the knees go out, I'm your guy. Well, we always talk about the, you know, people that are very uncommon. Marty is definitely that person. <laughs> so we are going to talk oh, yeah. about identifying dysfunction. Um, through assessments, um, we did design kind of a corrective exercise program that blends into phase one. So if you don't have your CES yet, that's fine, because the way that we've put it into the program, you, it, you should easily be able to follow along why we chose those exercises. And then again, we will stress this so that probably the day that we die, which is every four to six weeks, your body is going to start to adapt to the demand you're placing on it. So it's important to make sure you reassess to hopefully start seeing positive changes in the dysfunction that you notice when you first assess your client. Well said. So why don't we just jump right into it? What do you think? I think that's great. And guess what? Shockingly, we are going to start with an overhead squat assessment. So you want me to jump in here, Wendy? And Absolutely. So not a surprise if you've been watching any of these over the last two years with Wendy and I, there's some commonality. One, as Wendy said, we're going to assess. And we're going to assess, we start with the overhead squat assessment because it's safe, it's effective, and it gives us a lot of information on how this individual moves through their regional independence model or their kinetic chain. 
So this will look at dynamic posture, core stability, and then obviously the neuromuscular control. As I already mentioned, it's appropriate for everybody. If they're cleared to fit to do fitness, they're cleared to do an overhead squat. The key thing though is setting somebody up for success so you can determine if they truly have movement compensations. If somebody, if you ask them, hey, stand with your feet hip with apart and feet straight, their feet may be slightly turned out and they don't even know that that's not straight. Now that doesn't mean they're going to fail or have that compensation. I don't want to use the word fail or big fat fail like Wendy likes to say. <laughs> and I enjoy that, Marty. Come on. Now. That's why I threw it in there for you. I say just moving compensations, but you know, we all have our own lingo. But so give them the opportunity to be set up correctly first. So you might say, hey, look at your feet. They're a little turned out. Can you start with them straight? Now, if they start to position and do things after that, then you know that that's going to be a compensation, but at least give them that starting chance. Same thing when they, when you ask them to put their arms over their head, I could have my arms here and it, they think it's over their head. We're looking for full, you know, range of motion in the shoulder. After that, I don't overcoach it. I don't tell them what I'm looking for. I don't tell them what to do or what not to do. All I say is I want to watch how you choose to move through this squatting pattern. It'll allow me to determine the best way to create a training program for you. I don't use the word big fat fail or dysfunction, <laughs> things like that. We use that together as um, right. peer to peer, right? So we just want to get a big look of how they choose to move. And from there, there's a lot of compensations. But today we're going to talk about what happens when the knees adduct or come in. Now, some key points. And I know if I don't mention this, Wendy will jump on it right away. Shoes have to be off. Yes. If at all possible. On occasion, if you're dealing with a senior, you're dealing with somebody that is, you know, is still a little skittish on what's going on. Okay. But it, if at all possible, shoes off. What I'll tell you is whatever compensation you do see with their shoes on, going to get worse with their shoes off. And a lot of times you won't see the compensation because their heels could be elevated in the shoe. The shoe itself is wide enough to give them a little more balance and you have no visualization of what's happening at the foot. But again, if you do have to do that on occasion, I get it, but the compensations may be hidden or will be worse when you do eventually get them with their shoe off. Yeah. Wendy, anything to add in there? No, I mean, and, and again, the reason we stress that to your point, Marty, you know, they can like those cute little Nike air shoes. If they have any kind of elevation in the heel, you're actually giving dorsiflexion to them, which is what we want to see, because without that, if they're limited, then their feet will go out. But then also it's the arch support. And, you know, oftentimes we don't know if the, the arches are caving in. We don't, you know, and, and that can lead to multiple things that leads to possibly the knees moving inward as well. If you start to notice that compensation just based on biomechanics. So, you know, those of you guys that are just joining Marty Miller and I on the Master Instructor Roundtable this week, we're talking about the knees moving inward compensation. And just so far, these are the, the first places that we start. Start with the assessment, remove the shoes. As Marty said, five kinetic chain checkpoints on the setup, and then make sure that, you know, when you, I would demonstrate it because some people, you can tell them to squat and they don't understand the hinge. They don't understand anything. And again, you're not over coaching it, but if you show them, so show, tell, do, because people learn differently then it's important that, you know, once they see it, then they understand exactly what you're looking for. So not only for us as professionals to see dysfunction, if it's not ideal, which most of the time we don't see the perfect squat, but it also takes away anxiety for people that don't really know what you're asking them to do. And they'll be like, yeah, okay. And then it's a disaster because they don't understand what you're asking. And it's not necessarily their body can't do it. Right. Yep. No, very well said. Key thing is to make them feel comfortable. And for somebody who doesn't really want to do an assessment, just say, I'm going to do a total body warm up. Let's see how, let's just move. Yep. All right. So awesome. Let's All right. Move. On we <laughs> go. So speaking of assessments, clearly we have, we kind of skip past the static posture because we're talking about the transitional here today with knees move in. So again, we're taking a small segment of the entire process and focusing on one thing but you've got your transitional movement and mobility assessment. So if you do have that CES background and I know Wendy will bring up the goniometer, so I'm gonna save that for her. It's, we just know each other well. It just gives you the opportunity to really isolate where the dysfunction comes from the more you tend to you know, dig into your studies and learn more about anatomy. Because there are different ways that these movement compensations can occur. So if you have the CPT background and or the CES, there's some added 
assessments that you can dig into to really find out where the dysfunction is coming from. So as we look at our flow chart here of the assessments, we're always going to mark down all compensations, even if they're minimal, because in the book, we tend to show them exaggerated so you can visually see what they could look like. That's not always what they're going to look like in real life. But if somebody has a, a minor movement dysfunction, it's probably only going to get worse if you ignore it. So we're always going to check any type of movement dysfunction. The beauty of what NESM has created is you have your solutions table. So it's, I always say it's my recipe book. If I need to go downstairs and I need to cook something that is not my skill set, the first thing I'm going to take out is the recipe and I'm going to follow it. If I follow it, I'm going to get reasonably good or good results. May not be as excellent as somebody that's trained to a higher level, but I will get a good outcome. Same thing with your solutions table. This is going to guide you on see this, do that. As you go in and get more advanced credentials or you get more time in the field and you learn some other things, you're going to see that you might even be able to get better results. But there's nothing wrong with good right out of the gate. So follow that solutions table. And the more you follow it, the more you're going to learn it without even having to look at it. So Wendy and I always, always hammer in, have that solution table with you during your assessments, during your program design. So Wendy, before I jump in or whoever jumps into the other bullet points, anything else to add there? No, I mean, I think you pretty much nailed it. And I'm terrible at cooking, so I definitely need a recipe book. <laughs> right. Or just something you hit start on. You know what my favorite now is? I, I We're going way off topic, is the air fryer. You just put it in and walk away. Like even I can do that. I have an air fryer and haven't used it yet. <gasps> you don't know I, what you're missing. I know. I know. So for those of you that are joining, this is not NASM Cooks. This is the NASM Master Instructor Roundtable. And we'll talk about knees move in. Don't ask me how we talked about cooking. But that's you never know what you're going to get today. So you don't. So as we move on to the advanced assessments, again, as you go into the deeper, we'll go back here a quick slide, is we have the other ones, like Wendy said, we have the modified overhead squat, feet elevated, which shows if it's a foot and ankle issue. The single leg squat, as Wendy was talking about, to really see what happens comparing the overhead squat with the single leg squat. And if we had to pick one for lower body, single leg squat would be it because that's how we move around in real life. We came out with a split squat. So that way it's a bridge between the overhead squat and the single leg. And then Wendy, I'll let you wrap up here with the mobility assessments or goniometer. Yeah. And, and those of you guys that, um, you know, are, have had our CES for a long time in our previous editions, we talked about the goniometer and the goniometer looks like a human protractor. And that's where we really look at joints and we're looking for ideal range of motion. And then we're taking that to an end range. And then at that point, we're seeing from ideal, where are they? And the beauty of what NASM done with the newest CE, CES content, and you've heard Marty and I talk about this as soon as it was released, we were super, super excited about the mobility assessments because now if you're not familiar or you don't have one or you just really don't know how to use a goniometer, you don't know what numbers to read, the mobility assessments are super, super quick and they're simple to do. And basically you put you know, the, the individual in specific positions and either they can do it or they cannot do it with or without compensation. So you have options here and we're going to actually show you the ones that on a mobility standpoint that we would use. And then if you're familiar with the goniometer and you love it, I used it today, just got done using it um, because I, I, I grew up in the field learning how to use a goniometer. So therefore, I still use it. However, in all reality, the mobility assessments are quicker and easier to do. So um, if we go to the next slide, you'll kind of see a little bit more of what we're talking about. You know, and here are some examples like when Marty just said the overhead squat assessment and or the modified overhead squat with the heels elevated, you can see that the first individual that's doing the overhead squat, his feet are flat on the floor, shoes are off. He's got slight external rotation. His elbows are bent. I mean, this is just from an anterior view. And then from the lateral view, we're looking for, again, those parallel lines. The reason for the parallel lines, just to reiterate stuff we've said in the past, is if you have those parallel lines from a lateral view, that means you have equal weight distribution between the ankles, the knees, and the hips. And that's what ideally we want. And so if that individual can do that, then you're not marking with certain compensations. However, if you notice that the feet are out, you notice that the knees are coming in, you notice that maybe there's some stuff going on at the hips, and you're not sure kind of if it's the chicken or the egg, meaning the ankles or the hip that's causing the knee impairment, 
then if you elevate and you can see that's a two by four. So if you elevate just a small amount, you can use textbooks if you want. You can use like the what 10 pound weights if you want. And I say that like the actual, um, you know, like dumbbell weights uh, or um, sorry, barbell weights. And, you know, you elevate the heels, something that's flat. If it cleans up, then you're going to notice that that is probably the foot and the ankle that's leading to the knee. And I hate to say it this way, but the knee is a, not really the smartest joint in your body. It is basically ran off of what your ankles are telling it to do and what your hips are telling it to do. And so it's usually an ankle or hip issue or ankle issue or a hip issue that's leading to the dysfunction that you're seeing in the knee. Yeah. And if, if you do this um, elevated squat and you notice that maybe their feet cleaned up, but their knees are still doing some other stuff and there's still a lot of stuff going on at the hip, then it could be just the hip that's causing it. Or if you notice that even when you elevate to, or if you, um, or if you elevate and you see that the feet cleaned up, then you know that it's also the, the foot and ankle. If the, you know, if, if that's not the case and they didn't even have that at, at the beginning, then elevating may not be your answer. It's just, you're taking the, you know, pieces of the puzzle and trying to figure out which it is to help you in your programming. So to me, I find that one to be super beneficial because it tells me a lot. Right. Easy, quick, awesome information in 30 seconds. Yep. Excellent. All right. Moving on. Well, here we go. Knee valgus. So if we look at the image on the left, when the knees come together, when the space from the natural setup gets closer together, that's valgus. That's the, the technical term. Some people say knees adduct. The, yes, they're adducting, but the position is a valgus position of the the joint there. Varus would be when the space widens or gets further apart. So again, can happen, not as common as the valgus, but varus would be the technical term when the knees go into abduction. And you'll see here, the last one is what we call knee dominance. Now this might be fixed right away, or this might be something that you may have to work on over a period of time. And when I say maybe fixed right away is as Wendy had mentioned earlier, not everyone knows how to squat even though they do it every day when they sit in their chair, et cetera, et cetera. So when you say, Hey, can I, can I have you squat either two leg or one leg? If you see this, it's the same. I've seen it in both. You'll see that this individual did not hinge the hip. Like Wendy showed in the previous slide where there was a parallel line between the tibia and fibula and the spine. This person is trying to lower just by pushing their knee forward because they don't subconsciously want to load that glute. If you think about a good squat, you really have to trust your glutes to keep you, you know, in the right position. They're kind of going to hang on so you can sit down and back. So sometimes, again, you can visualize, oh, look what you're doing here. Let's sit back. And then, boom, they clean it up right away. You're good. On you go. But especially when you go to one leg, sometimes they just don't have that stability and strength in the glute complex to sit back. So they lower themselves in the upright position just by pushing the knee forward. So that's what we call knee dominance. So that's a sign of movement dysfunction, but also a big part of that will be a lack of core stability and glute stability and strength to hold the body in the right position. And unfortunately, you know, this could be something that they learned yeah. um, from like previous people that have been in the fitness industry by just misunderstanding what was meant. So when you tell someone to keep your back flat and, you know, again, when you look at the lateral view, you're looking for parallel lines, right? Your back is straight. And so, you know, some people will say flat. And so when people think flat or straight, they're thinking straight up and down, not that it can lean forward. And so what they're trying to do often without hinging back first and leaning forward, they're trying to keep their back nice and straight because they just, that's either how they learned it. So, you know, it could just be misunderstanding. And so to Marty's point, you want to cue them like, okay, listen, I noticed that you're doing this. I want you to try just to lean forward a little bit and then let's see how you do. And then you're still looking for parallel lines. I mean, again, tell them, you know, Hey, just lean forward a little bit, sit back like you're going to sit in a chair. And then at that point, go for it. If they still continue to do this, like you would put knee dominance. And for those of you that are just joining us right now, myself, Marty Miller here with my friend, Wendy Batts, we are doing our master instructor roundtable. This week's topic is knees adduct. So we're kind of going through what that means, what it looks like, and then of course, how to fix it. Yes. Nice to know.
Thank you. All right, so single leg squat assessment. Now, again, these people need to be a little more advanced. You have to make sure that when you're doing the two-legged overhead squat assessment, you want to set them up in the five kinetic chain checkpoints, as Marty and I said. Now, if you notice that your clients, feet are turning way out, the knees are coming in, they've got a lot of things going on, then it may not be safe at that point for someone to do a single leg squat because it could cause some serious issue to the knee if it's already shooting in and the foot's turned out. Think about the amount of force, pressure, and weight that you're putting on the, the medial side of the knee, which is not ideal. And we're not trying to injure someone, we're just trying to gather information. So ideally, when someone's set up for the single leg squat, you put them on the, the five kinetic chain checkpoints with two feet, and then you just tell them to shift their weight a little bit and lift up their floating leg. Now the floating leg should stay right beside the, the ankle, of the leg that's planted on the ground. And the reason being is if they shoot their leg forward, you're asking them to do a pistol squat and most people don't have that strength and they're also going to automatically posterior tilt or flex their spine excessively in order to do a pistol squat, which we've talked about again in previous webinars. Same thing if you're shooting your leg back, this is not like a different type of exercise. What we're trying to do is find out how they move on one leg. And if you go backwards, then it can throw the hips off, which can cause different rotational movements in the torso and spine. That's not what we're looking for. We're looking to see the foot and ankle and then what's happening at the torso when they're on one foot and marking it accordingly. However, that's when we started talking then about the split squat, that if someone can't safely balance on one leg or you notice a ton of different you know, compensations and you don't feel comfortable, then the split squat would be just literally doing a lunge and then noticing what's happening at the front leg. Well said. Important assessment, but um, often kind of misunderstood how to put it together and, you know, how easy it is to actually, you know, coach somebody through it so you can get some good results. Indeed. Mobility, your favorite. You want to start this one off? Yeah. And, and, you know, as Marty and I were saying before, you've got so many different options to try to find out what's happening. And, you know, we're looking at range of motion at the knee. And so, you know, oftentimes when I'm using a goniometer, I'll do knee extension, which you're going to see. And then also I will do like internal and external rotation of the hip again, just to see, you know, what's happening there. And I look at the ankle. So again, I'm kind of like taking it, you know, to the extreme. But if we're just talking about the knee itself, if you have someone lay down, and they can be obviously on a table, they can be even be on a floor, depending on what you have available, put them on a mat, you have them lay down, you have them grab the behind on their hamstring, and then just lift their leg to 90 degree, like at the hip, so 90 degree at the hip, and then extend their, their knee. If their knee is straight without compensation, meaning that their head doesn't rise up, they're not looking at what's happening, they're not curling in, their, in the um, spine, and they're not doing anything like externally rotating or anything with the leg that's straight, and they can extend it to where there's no bend, then they pass this. If they cannot do it and there's a slight bend in the knee or a major bend in the knee, then they fail that mobility assessment. So you know yeah. that there's also some issues, a big fat fail. So yeah, very quick, very easy. Again, letting you know. Now, if somebody's knees caved in and then they did this assessment and their knee was straight without compensation, on a programming standpoint, then you know it's more musculature, like muscular um, affiliated, meaning the underactive muscles really need activation and the overactive muscles aren't what's causing that restriction. So on a programming side, it's trying to let you kind of think ahead. So when you design the programs, you know really what to pinpoint, especially because you may only have an hour with your clients each week or each week or during that session. Yeah, it's just a, a very good way to be more, you know, specific, pinpoint, laser focused, so you get the best outcomes. Yes. Well said. Perfect. So you now you're just we're going through here your favorite your goniometer. So again, <laughs> since you are the goniometer, the goniometer. So I do a range of motion, guys. And again, when we're talking about knee extension, we want to try to actually fully extend the knee. Right. And ideally, if you do that and you're looking at a goniometer, and that's why I said sometimes it's important because if you look at the goniometer, which is in the picture, the human protractor, you would end up having, you have, a, you know, an axis of stability arm, and then you've got the round piece with a bunch of different numbers. You have to know how to read the numbers in order to get the right data. 
And so ideal for extension is anywhere from zero to 10 degrees. And that's what, what you're looking for. Anything more than that means that there is obviously a lack of range of motion. And so as you can see, this person that's on the table is not even close to up and down or even just a slight bend. So that's why I say you've got the option to either do the mobility, which is what you just saw previously, or you can use the goniometer and find out from ideal, where are they? Are they perfect or not? So you've so got two different of those options. readings where the smaller number is better. Yes, this is a backwards one. <laughs> Depending on how you think, yes, right. greater is not better here. <laughs> no, you do not want large numbers. You want close to zero. <laughs> and those of you guys that are joining Marty Miller and I, we're talking about the knees moving inward compensation based on some of the emails and, and um, feedback that we've gotten just for people that need help. So we've talked a little bit about the importance of assessing and knowing what may be you know, causing the compensation and trying to help you identify what you need to know um, on the musculature and everything. So we've talked about different types of assessments, such as the overhead squat, the single leg squat, the split stance. We talked about mobility assessments. And now, Marty, why don't you talk yes. to us about the muscles? Yeah. So again, now if you're looking at what could be causing this, right? So Wendy's done a great job of giving you some different ideas on how to assess it. So now we look at when you see this motion or any faulty motion, certain muscles are causing it, certain muscles are allowing it. So here on the knees moving inward, the overactive are going to be the adductor complex. Again, if you really love your anatomy in the CES, we start to talk about the five different adductor muscles and go through, well, if you see this, then it could be this or this, that, the other. But as a whole, you're going to see that it's the adductor complex needs to be inhibited and then lengthened your lateral gastroc that helps to actually rotate the lower leg, which makes the knee want to adduct on top of it. The vastus lateralis, that big, the largest quad muscle on the outside where most people think they're foam rolling their IT band, they are, but that nice tender spots that you're feeling is well beyond the IT band because that's so superficial. It's that big vastus lateralis. And then the bicep for more short head that Wendy was just showing with the movement assessment. Again, that has the ability to externally rotate the lower leg, which then forces the knee into adduction. And then finally, all the way at the hip, the tensor fascia lata, due to its connection on the IT band, due to the IT band's connection past the knee joint, when that's overactive with your foot in the ground, again, causing external rotation with some adduction, causing that motion of the knee to go inward. So these are all the muscles that you need to look at that would be overactive. And when we say that, just to kind of piggyback, now that you have the list, and this list can be found on your solutions table, so it wasn't like I'm going through anatomy books and Marty and I are like, hmm, let's think this through. This was given to you and all your NASM content. It's in the solutions table to help you. And then this is taken more from the CES because we gave you more of a breakdown of a specifically which muscles it is versus just the quads or the, the outer hip. We're telling you it's the TFL, the, the vastus lateralis and so forth. So when you're looking and thinking about overactivity of muscles, these are the muscles that you want to foam roll to downregulate, you know, the overactivity. And then after that, you're going to want to statically stretch to restore proper length back into the muscles that are in a shortened position that means they're overactive, right? So we're trying to get better length positioning on the overactive muscles. So foam roll and statically stretch these. And then let me guess what's coming next. Could it be the underactive muscles? Um, I would say that's yes. Very <sighs> probable, yes. <laughs> a good guess on my part. Yeah. All right. Oh, what do you know? Here we go. So when we look at the underactive, so now this are the ones we want to upregulate. These are the ones that we want to have them join the party, do a little more work kind of the yin to the yang. So that way there's symmetry on both sides of the body. So we get our ideal movement. So when we look at the list here, if the, um, the well, we can start at the bottom and work our way up or the top down. So if we look at, if the lateral gastroc was overactive, guess what? The medial gastroc is going to be underactive. If the lateral hamstring complex or the bicep for more short head is overactive, then the medial hamstring is going to be underactive. And I would tend to say on every single movement compensation, especially from like core down, glute max, glute medius, I still never have seen them overactive. I'm waiting for that time. I haven't seen <laughs> any. Then, either. 
<laughs> yeah. And then finally, the VMO, that small part of the quad, the teardrop muscle that helps stabilize the knee, that would be the one in that area that is underactive. So we have a lot of exercises uh, that address all these in between the CES and the CPT. We're more here to identify right here on this slide, which ones need to be turned on. Yep. And so as Marty just said, think about underactive. So we just talked about the overactive, you're going to formal and stretch. The underactive, if you can kind of pinpoint specific active or activation exercises, specific ones per muscle group, that would be most ideal. And so one of the things that Marty and I were talking about was, you know what, you've got people that are CES and some people that haven't taken it yet because they're just brand new to NASM in general. So we're going to actually show you the combination. And one of the reasons why we blended it so this could be a webinar for all. And hopefully if you do see this compensation that you can take this program, utilize it because it's a full body workout with your clients and knowing that it is going to very specifically stress this one assessment, but it can be used for multiple things. Perfect. So workout time it is. <laughs> hey, well, there we go. So I'll go through maybe the warm up and activation then I'll turn it over to you. How's that? Perfect. So again, we're following the specific, excuse me, sets and reps that would be in your content. So this is nothing that we just made up at, uh, you know, on our own at the last minute. So self myofascial techniques for the lateral gastroc, the bicep femoris short head, the TFL and the adductors. You're going to hold the tender areas for 30 seconds. Then we're going to statically stretch those same muscles, right? We down regulate them and then we're going to add length back to them. So we've got the lateral gastroc, bicep femoris short head, TFL and the adductors. And again, we're going to, to do static stretching. We need to get in the right position, hold it for a minimum of 20 to 30 seconds. Now, optional, depending on how you want to do with your workout, you can put in a dynamic stretch, stretch once you got this individual moving better. So shockingly that it's lateral tube walks, because I think that's mandatory with every single one of Wendy's clients with glute bridges, which what do you know? There's a ball bridge coming up. So she's going to have it 10 steps each way. So that way you're starting to get the body to move at a higher tempo, but you've got everything firing in the right way to before you did that. And then from an activation, which is our core imbalance, ball, hamstring, curls, toes inwards, because that identifies or targets that medial hamstring complex. So you'll see two sets, 12 repetitions at that slow tempo of four, two, one. Then a floor or ball bridge, again, same sets and reps and tempo. And then terminal knee extension. You'll have a tube around the individual's leg. The resistance will be coming from uh, them in front of them. So they, as they extend their knee into terminal extension, they get some resistance. Great thing, just put a towel behind the band, especially if they're wearing shorts. And you're going to do 12 on each leg. So that's a great warm up into activation. And this is before the workout even really starts. Mm -hmm. So... When, if you want to go from skill development on. Yeah. And, and again, you know, if you notice that the, the client's feet turn out and the knees cave in and there's a lot of dysfunction and, you know, you are just now beginning with a client, then maybe they're not ready to do. And that's why you'll see oftentimes it'll say optional in the beginning. They may not be ready to do like a squat jump with a hold. The thing is, is most people are active that are coming into the gym. Most people are already jumping around, moving around, running, doing a lot of activity. So from, from the start, I, I would say a majority of the time we'll start them with some kind of plyometric with the stabilization hold to work on landing mechanics, work on proper movement pattern at a, at a faster rate, and then holding that landing repositioning. And then at that point being able to, um, you know, kind of work on things that are going to help them in everyday activities. So for this particular individual, I would have them do a um, squad jump with a stabilization hold again, holding that landing for three to five seconds, realigning them if when uh, upon landing that feet start turning out their knees are coming you know starting to come in and and having them do it in front of a mirror so that way they can start to you know, like see what they're doing and have a better understanding because again i'm very visual most of my clients are also visual so just something to think about and you know if i was doing this like for real that i would do all the warm-up itself and then i would go into all the activation exercises that marty just discussed add in that plyometric with the stabilization hold. And then I would repeat that again. So I would do all of it in a vertical load, which means one after another, after another, after another, after the squat jump, give them a rest if needed. And then I would repeat that for, for my second set. That's how I personally do that. And I call that an extended warm up 
completely up to you and up to your client on the way you want to handle that. But personally, that's what I do. Once that extended warm up is done, then I prepare the body to help with those, that particular compensation of the knee moving inward. Then I just do a full body workout, really emphasizing proper form. So I do the ball chest press. Reason being, they're in a glute bridge. I'm firing an a underactive muscle the entire time while working the chest. So it's a win-win for both. The TRX inverted row, again, you've got to really work on core stability and strength. We're also working on the row because as you think about this too, what can happen if, if the knees are moving in because of lack of, of core stability and issues at the hip with the lat inserting into the lower part of the hip, then you're going to think too, it's a win-win by doing something along those lines. Again, working um, the mid to lower trap and rhomboids. Prone, which means face down, ball cobra. Again, I would put their feet up against the wall, extend their legs. So they're going into triple extension. So they are really firing their calves their quads and their glutes and their abs, maintaining proper alignment and then going into a cobra. So again, still working on muscles that tend to be very underactive. And then again, the, the um, single leg TRX squat. And th what the TRX can do is help give dorsiflexion if it's a foot and ankle issue by still working on making sure the quad and the glute, which are the prime movers in a squat, are activating accordingly, working on the five kinetic chain checkpoints and giving them assistance in that squat to do it correctly until their body has better range of motion throughout their workout. After that, of course, heaven forbid, we not do the gun show. So a single leg, again, working on the foot and ankle, still working on arch alignment. We add in the tricep pushdowns. Um, this is something that especially females really want to work on because they don't want to have the flabby back of the arm. And then after you've done that, and again, I would do that in a vertical load. So I would go chest back. I would go, um, when I say back, I would do the row and then the cobras. And then I would go into the squat, I would go into the triceps, and then I would give them water if needed, and then I would repeat. That's my preference that I do, especially with my weight loss clients, just because that's the, the ultimate goal, as you can see at the top. And then once that's done, then we would end up doing the cool down. And the cool down is just as important in the warm up. But no matter what phase of training, again, you're going to foam roll the muscles that you feel either you worked a lot in the actual workout or ones that you have identified as needing the extra work. So you're going to see that it's repeated above. And then we're always going to finish with static stretching to realign those muscles that we used in the workout, as well as the ones that we know right now tend to be overactive that cause that compensation. Yep. Great. So for those of you that are just joining Wendy and myself on the regional, on the master instructor roundtable, we're going over knees move inward. And we just finished talking about a, a program that will address that. So we went through how to identify it, how to assess it, and then now how to program for it. And Wendy, I would do it the exact same way, the vertical load that you're talking about for any of my clients' goals. Yep. So if we go into our takeaways, I'm shocked that we see identify the compensations, which means number two, assessments are key. And then we have to record anything not ideal, as I had mentioned earlier, even if it's minimal, because that means that person may, it could potentially uh, get worse from there. And then we have to work on areas to help correct faulty movement patterns. It's either right or it's wrong. We're either moving better or we're moving worse. There's really no in between. And then Wendy, you made a couple great points about the value of assessing every four to six weeks formally. But let's remember every exercise, every set, every rep is a movement assessment. Well done. And hopefully, again, we're not trying to overwhelm you guys. We just want to provide you with some examples, give you feedback of why we chose these exercises, let you see that you know, you, you don't want to just emphasize one compensation, still work their full body. The client wants to get a, like a full body workout and they're trying to, to do weight loss. You're building strength. You're working on, on core stabilization, stability, all of that fun stuff. And so, again, can you put plug and play with whatever you want? Yes. Tempo is key in phase one. Tempo is key with corrective exercises, really focusing, again, on, um, you know, decelerating. That's why you're going to see the four um, to one tempo. So, if you guys have any questions about what we talked about, you can always contact me at wendy.bats at nasm.org, or you can find me on Instagram, shoot me a message over, and it's at wendy.bats13. And then to get a hold of me, my email is marty.miller at nasm.org, and Instagram is dr.martymiller72. So thank you for uh, continuing to give us those questions. So that's how we create our content. 
keep them coming. And we look forward to seeing you all next week on the Master Instructor Roundtable.